We are honored to open this year's event with a piece of Israeli choral music titled Erev Shel Shoshanim. The words are from the biblical Song of Songs and the translation is as follows. Let us go out to the grove. Myrrh, fragrant spices and incense are a threshold for your feet. Night falls slowly and the wind of roses is blowing. Let us whisper you a song, secretly, a song of love. We hope you enjoy.
The Ninth Street Singers, directed by James Wilson. It's been such a blessing to us over the years to begin each one of these lectures with music. Welcome to Viterbo University, and welcome to the 24th Holocaust Lecture. Um, it's, it's been such a privilege to put these on. I want to remind you before I forget that there will be refreshments and a book signing in the lobby following this event. Um, and I want to thank so many of the people who've, who've made it possible for us to hold these lectures over the years, beginning with our generous donors. We've had many donors over the years to the Reinhardt Institute and especially the Reinhardt family. And, and without their generous gifts, we wouldn't have been able to put on these events. Um, I also want to thank um, the members of the Ethics Institute, Jill Miller and Jenny Waters especially, but also all of our student fellows who have been working for months to coordinate and promote uh, this event. And I would ask you just to recognize them and thank them for all of their work. I am especially grateful to Daryl Klott, who came up with the idea of holding a series of lectures in 2005, right after she retired from La Crescent High School, where she had been bringing in Holocaust survivors to speak to students. And she said, wouldn't it be great to bring some of these survivors to come and speak to our community? And so now um, what you're going to hear tonight is a 24th uh, speaker that we've had in this series. Um, Daryl has been a champion of Holocaust education in this region and in the state. A few years after we had been having these lectures, she said, why don't we do something really to, to try to extend Holocaust education into the next generation and really work with teachers in the area. And so we started the Holocaust Educators Workshop. This year will be the 17th annual Holocaust Workshop. We have 73 uh, attendees this year. And I would like you all to recognize especially two of the nationally known educators who come every year to participate in this event. Steven Feinberg, retired outreach coordinator for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, travels here from San Diego, and Dana Humphrey, who comes here from St. Louis. Would you both please stand up? And lastly, and, and most importantly, I would like to thank all of you who have, who have shown up so faithfully every year uh, to support our survivors. Attention is the sincerest form of respect. And I want you to know how important your welcoming presence has been to survivors over the years. I will never forget the evening 14 years ago when Marty Weiss stood on this stage he told us about the burdens of, of his days at Mauthausen, carrying rocks up the mountain. Um, also the heavier burdens of, of, of grief and anger and even hatred that he bore. For many years afterwards, the burden of being separated from humanity. He received a standing ovation from you that night. And he came backstage afterwards and he he asked me, he said, is that all right? I was thinking, is that all right? That was beautiful. Um, but he's still bearing this burden of loss all these years later. And the power of reconnection with humanity that you gave him and that you give to all our survivors is really valuable. I wish we had the power to ensure that those losses would never be imposed upon people again. Yet we know from events taking place in the world today that we do not have that power. We are a small university in a small city in the Midwest. We may not have the power to change the world, but we have the power to create the kind of world we would like to see here in the company of one another. I ask that you use that power to surround our speaker tonight with the presence of your love. And now to introduce our speaker, 
Please welcome Daryl Clot. I need this. Thanks, Rick. I don't follow directions very well. I am Daryl Clot, and I'm really pleased to be here. I have the very best job on the face of the earth. I am a teacher, and I am proud to say that I'm a Holocaust educator. Oh. And now I'm going to tell you a little adventure. Okay? Ida was supposed to fly in yesterday at 4 o'clock from Chicago. And you know what the weather was like. And we had a little reception planned for her last night at 6 o'clock. Well, guess whose flight got canceled? <laughs> yeah. Her flight got canceled due to the snow. And then, then we were worried about her getting here today even because it, you saw the weather today. So we made the decision to not have her fly on her flight as scheduled, but instead to have a driver bring her here. So she rode for five and a half hours from Chicago today. What a trooper, I'm telling you. She's, I can't wait for you all to meet her. Okay, I just want to say that director James Wilson and accompanist Judy Staffsleen and the wonderful Ninth, Ninth Street Singers, thank you, you were wonderful. Oh. <laughs> I want to announce that WKBT will broadcast tonight's presentation on channel 8.2 on Saturday, April 6th at 4 p.m. So if you want to record it and watch it again, you can do that, or you want to share this information with someone who couldn't be here tonight. I repeat, on Saturday, April 6th at 4 p.m., WKBT will, re will broadcast this on channel 8.2. Now, tonight's presentation, along with all of our Holocaust speakers, will be on the Viterbo Ethics and Leadership website. We are very fortunate to be here tonight because we're going to touch history. This year marks the 19th year that Viterbo University has been involved in Holocaust education, and Rick talked about this. And I do want to say that, as Rick said, we have 73 teachers here, teachers and and um, long-term, long long-life learners that just like to learn about the Holocaust. We started out in 2007 with 42 people. And this has grown and grown and grown. We started out for the first several years um, with a one-day workshop. And then we learned that we were jamming so much information into these poor people's heads that they could hardly take it. So we ended up going to two days in 2011. And we canceled in 2020 due to COVID. And in 2021, we ran it via Zoom. Rick said, Daryl, we're not canceling two years in a row. We're going to run this thing via Zoom. And I was a nervous wreck, thinking that we wouldn't have people that wanted to do that. But we had many. We have had 875 people come to our workshops. And we have had Participants from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, New York, and Alabama. If you're involved in the workshop, either as a presenter or a participant, would you please stand up? Where are you? <laughs> thank you. Teachers, thank you for teaching your students what happens when people fail to accept other people's differences? Or they remain bystanders when they see injustice occur. Okay. Many of you are familiar with the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration and their prayer partners who have been praying around the clock for 146 years for prayer requests that come in from all over the world. The sisters are one of Viterbo's greatest treasures, and I want to thank them for praying that Ida would stay healthy so she could come tonight. And I'm going to add something on this prayer from now on, and that is, please, Lord, let's have good weather. <laughs> okay, I'm thrilled that so many of you are here tonight because you're going to touch history. You're going to learn about the past from someone who lived it. 
The age of survivors is drawing to a close. Before long, there'll be no one left to say, I was there, I saw, I remember what happened. Now, it's time to hear Ida's inspirational story. It's my privilege to introduce my new dear friend, Ida. Come on out, please. All right, when the war started and Germany invaded your country of Poland, what happened to your father? Okay. My father, being a good citizen of Poland, he felt that he should join the Polish army. And of course he did. The war didn't last more than a few weeks. He became a prisoner of the Germans. And by the border, by Russian border, the Russian took away the prisoners, and that's how my father survived. So he was in Russia. He, he survived in Russia, that's right. When you were three years old, what happened to your mother? Okay. Well, the main thing that the you know, German wanted to do is to des destroy the Jewish nation, and they built ghettos. And I remember in 1942, we were herded into a ghetto in the Sosnowiec, where, we, where I was born. And there was a selection, selection by Gestapo, special police to do the dirty work. So as we came in, they were throwing people to the right, let's say, older and sick, and right away they were sent to a death camp. To the left, they pushed people who were young and healthy and sent them to a working camp. And then they came to the mothers to take away the children. And as we stood there, my mother, my older sister, Genia, my brother, my twin brother, Adam, my mother knew what's gonna happen if they take us away, that she'll never, never see us again. So my mother ran across the street, we followed her, and my mother jumped from a third floor. And that started chaos in the ghetto. My mother's sister was there, my aunt Rose, and she took us into hiding. I don't remember much about the hiding, but I remember that I was walking one day with my aunt Rose by the barbed wires of the ghetto, and suddenly we heard a voice of a man who was behind the barbed wires. He was a friend of my aunt. He was a Christian Catholic man who used to work with her, and she was not at work, he came to look at the ghetto, in the ghetto. And as it happened, I was walking, I was the only one actually walking with my aunt, not my brother or my sister. And he right away, when he saw me, he said, Rose, who is this little girl? Because he knew she had boys. And she told him that now, maybe I'm an orphan and an extra mouth to feed. And he immediately offered to take me with him, but never to return me. You want to ask? And what was the stipulation? Well, when, they, when he took me out of the ghetto at night, after my aunt handed me over, he took me to another city to his wife. It was actually Christmas Eve, and when he opened his coat to his wife, he told her, Josephine, I brought you a Christmas gift. <laughs> Guess whom? I was the Christmas gift. And of course, there was this problem of my identity. They had to change my identity, so they baptized me, and I became, you know, a Christian, a Catholic, and they were hiding me uh, in the beginning, you know, to t teach me how to behave as a Catholic, you know, to pray and speak correctly. So I was with the family, and they were the most loving people in my world. Nobody ever loved me as much as they did, like I was there you know, real, real born to them child. That's so joyous to hear. Okay, so. Uh, and I wanna ask you um, about your adoptive father, Wilhelm, what happened to him? Okay, uh, as the German, you know, invaded Poland, there was shortage of everything, food, anything that you wanted, people have to, you know, just either, you know, stay in lines or, uh, 
will actually look through the garbage sometimes. So my Polish father decided that he's going to take a horse in a wagon and sell to the, in the neighborhood vodka, tobacco, cigarettes, and actually under all those produce he carried guns, ammunition for the partisans. He was working for the underground and somebody betrayed him. One day when they went by the village, I believe was named Odush, Gestapo was waiting for them and they shot my, my father. And the worst part was that when my father brought me, even right in the beginning, my Polish mother, Josephine, was pregnant already. And after that, you know, after she had no husband, and a few months later she delivered a baby girl, there was no food for her, so she decided to move in with her in-laws. And um, my Polish father actually was the only son of, I call them grandpa and grandpa, and grandfather. When he lost his only son, he became a crazy, vicious alcoholic because he lost his only son. And he was coming home drunk from morning till night and thrashing the house and chasing us and tried to beat us up. And sometimes he did. So my mother decided that this cannot go on. So, you know. And once you left your grandfather's house, um, how did you... And your mother make enough money to live? Okay, so my mother was kind of little genius, I would say, at that time. She took two suitcases, one for me, one little for me, and one for herself. And we went on the trains during the war to sell cigarettes and vodka. And, you know, that was something most unusual, but we were not scared. We didn't, you know, worry about it because we have to earn our living. And actually, we didn't get paid. Sometimes we got a piece of, of bread or a piece of sausage. And the worst part during this time was that uh, there was terrible things, you know, terrible lies spread about Jewish people, that Jews are not human beings, that they don't deserve to live, that they, you know, the worst part was said that Jews catch Polish children, kill them, and use their blood for matzah. Well, I didn't know any Jews and I didn't know, but I was scared. Oh, you were six years old when World War II ended? Yes. The Russians came to your town. Could you explain about that, please? Yes. Well, some people were, actually nobody was supposed to have radio, uh, you know, in their homes. So some people were hiding radios in their basements. And one day, they were already spreading news that, you know, the Germans are really losing the war. And one day was very quiet in town. And the next morning we hear music and we see tanks and here comes the Russian army to liberate us. People went crazy. They were so happy because now we're going to be free. We were free, but we still were hungry. Mm -hmm. So your father came home from Russia. And what happened then? Okay. When my father found out that I am... Um, before my aunt died, she left message to everybody that if somebody survived, you know, Ida is, you know, in Częstochowa. Częstochowa is the city where I was during the whole war. Um, so my father found out that I'm supposed to be in Częstochowa, and as he found me, he came to Grandpa and said, give me back my child. And Grandpa said, no, I'm not going to give you my child unless you pay me some big money, you know. He, he meant it, you know, like maybe I'll make it up thousands of dollars. And my father said, all I have is my shirt on my back. That's all I can give you. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So my father, my poor father had to go all over Poland to all kind of organizations and collect some money. And when finally he came and brought him some money, grandpa decided to give me, you know, a way back to my father, which I didn't recognize as my father because I knew that, you know, my father is buried in the cemetery. That was my father. And my father had a very hard time with me. He had to bring a taxi and forcefully put me on his lap. And he gave some money to grandpa. And grandpa was happy to get a little money so he can get plenty drunk. So my father took me away. And uh, since then, he took me to my aunt's house. Actually, my mother had... Uh, 
large family, a lot of uh, brothers and sisters, and only out of 13 children, only three of my aunts survived, and that's where my father took me in to, for that time. And actually, he didn't know what to do with me, so he put me into an orphanage. You were in a, Jew a Jewish home, correct? Yes. What was that like for you? It was the first time you were around Jews, really? Yes, yes. First of all, I did not believe I'm Jewish. Second of all, I, I was an anti-Semite because I heard those terrible things said about the Jewish people. So I didn't want to recognize my father as my father. You know, it took me a long time till I matured and knew that there was a Holocaust and this is my father. Just as you were starting to feel at home in this children's home, your father talked, <laughs> took you to live with Another him and, your new, and his new, new wife. Right. Would you describe yes. her and what happened? Yes, this is a terrible thing, you know, especially after the Holocaust, what I went through. Uh, my father married this ho horrible woman who was also a Holocaust survivor, who was mentally actually sick, and she resented me. She resented me so much she was hiding food and sometimes she was telling me, how come you survived and my children didn't? And she gave me this you know, feeling of guilt. Why did I survive? And you know, for the longest time in my life I felt my guilt is something of, some, you know, of something that happened to you know, all the Jews you know, and I survived. I was the lucky one. Eventually, you and your stepmother and your father moved to Israel. She did not want you living with them, so you ended up in a kibbutz. Right. Can you talk about that experience? Yes. Okay. So when I came to Israel, of course, I didn't speak Hebrew. So I ended up, as my friend here mentioned, to a kibbutz. Some of the government people decided that the kibbutz will help us out, and they will you know, allow us work half a day in the kibbutz and half a day study Hebrew. So first of all, uh, they were very kind to me. People knew that I'm a Holocaust survivor, so they became to me like my family. And um, I couldn't stay forever in the kibbutz because I was not a member. And for some, uh, another miracle, my mother's one of her cousins was li living in Natanya city uh, in Israel, and she allowed me to move in with her. So I moved in with her, and as happened, I had a camera, a photo camera, and I went to a studio with, you know, develop my film, and then I met this wonderful man who was very nice to me, and we got married. I know. Yeah, and then, you know, a few, few, a few years later, I delivered a baby girl that I named Named name after my um, my biological mom Esther, so we lived in Israel, you know, like everybody else. But I always remember I had a brother and a sister, and I went to all kind of government agencies to look for them if they immigrated to Israel. Unfortunately, I didn't find anyone, none of them. In 1963, I got a letter from my three aunts who survived, and they moved to Chicago. And when they moved to Chicago, they sent me a letter to Israel, because we already corresponded, and they said, Ida, why don't you come to United States? There are opportunities, and we are such a small family. Why don't you join us? So in 1963, I came to uh, Chicago with my three-year-old daughter, and guess what? I did not speak English. <laughs> so I had to start my life all over, you know, my culture and everything I could. Go to night school, learn a profession, raise a child, learn, you know, how to live the, the American way. I went to a supermarket, I didn't know what to buy. I bought dog food because I didn't know this is, you know, something for people, you know, it says meat, meat. Okay, meat for me is, is meat. <laughs> so anyway, as life went out, and I did learn uh, as much as I could English. It's not perfect, but it's pretty, people tell me it's I said it's good. really good. <laughs> okay. So I started to work and uh, send my daughter to the best school I could. And uh, eventually I came across a place which was a Holocaust museum. The museum happened because the Nazi party wanted to walk in Skokie, where I live and show their power. 
And there were a lot of Holocaust survivors living there. That's why they came to Skokie. And after that, we made sure that they cannot walk in Skokie. Our mayor helped us. We took them to the court, and they were forbidden to walk in Skokie. But what good things came out, came out the Holocaust Museum. We decided now we have to educate people so it won't happen again. And as I live not far from the museum, like almost across the street, I looked, you know, there are people walking there and what, what's happening there. So I knock on the door and I found that it's going to be a Holocaust museum and education center, not only museum. And they asked me, Ida, would you please join us and volunteer for us? We need help. We need to teach other people about what happened so it won't happen again. Believe it or not, I'm doing it over 30 years. I'm volunteering and I'm trying to do my best, you know, to help people to understand so it won't happen again. And we thank you. <laughs> thank you. Eventually, you became involved in child survivor and hidden children groups. And would you describe your research as you were searching for your twin brother, Adam? Yes. So uh, the group uh, that we, we joined ourselves, and it became very famous. And uh, when I was working in the Holocaust Museum, the secretary told me in 1991, Ida, you know that in New York, in a Hotel Marriott, there'll be a gathering of hidden children. Would you be interested? Of course I'll be interested. I'm looking for my brother and my sister, you know, all my present life. And I went to the museum, but a nice thing happened before even I went to the museum. I, my mother, before she died, my mother, in Paul, my biological mother, when the war started, she sent to United States, to Chicago, a picture of us sitting on my mother's lap, me, my twin brother, and my sister standing, my aunt and her son. So that was a treasure to me when I came to United States and got some kind of a, that kind of a picture to see my mother's face. So I put the picture on the wall like everybody in the hotel. They were running around, people putting pres putting documents and pictures. And I was looking, you know, every day if somebody wrote something, be, you know, beneath my picture, if they know anybody in, you know, from my family, nothing. Other people were lucky, they found cousins and friends. But I heard in a corner people speaking Polish. And they were from Poland, and they were hidden children. And now, 50 years later, nobody came to pick them up because either they were dead or lost. And they tell me that every day in Warsaw, they come and say, you know what? I don't know who I am, but my Polish parents told me that I was found on the street or somebody brought me in to your house, you know, to help. And I said, what? That's what's happening? Well, that's where I have to go, to Poland, to find my sister and my brother. And before I went to Poland, a friend of mine, my classmate, sent me an article from a newspaper, a Jewish newspaper, with a picture of a young man standing there. And when I looked at the picture, I saw, and I said, my gosh, he looks so much like, like my grandfather, because I also got a picture of my grandfather. And I said, this is strange. And besides that, he had a nickname, the Thumb. My Polish name, Paluch, is Thumb. That was his you know, nickname. And I said, a nickname and a picture, but I was afraid to do anything about it, to be disappointed. But eventually I said, I have to look into this matter. I found a lady who interviewed him in Poland, in Warsaw, and took the picture. And I talked to her and I said, could you please tell me more about this man? He had a different name, Jerzy Dolepski, not Adam Palu, like myself. And she said, Ida, he does have, he hardly has, he has no memory, that's all she told me. I said, that's okay. Give me his phone number. And I went, you know, and I called, you know, Poland. And a young voice answers, and I say, can I please speak to your father? And he said, my father is in Warsaw today. He cannot talk to you now. I say, when he comes home, please tell him to call me day or night, you know, whenever, because you tell them that I think I am his twin sister. Okay. I come home, we sit down to the dinner, 
<laughs> we sit down to the dinner, the telephone rings, and this time a man's voice on the telephone says, you left a message with my son that you think you are, think that you are my twin sister. When were you born? I said, I was born May 3rd, 1939. He said, for sure you're not my twin sister. I was born 1942. I said, how do you know you were born 1942? He said, because my Christian birth certificate says so. <laughs> ah, I said, that's strange, because I have a fake birth certificate too. And it says I was born 1942. I say, well, can you send me some picture of yourself? And you know, when you were young, so I can compare to the picture that I had, you know, that I found, you know, my aunt gave me here in the United States. He said, okay. I, will, can, I can send this to you. But you know what? I actually want you to help you how to, you know, to find your brother. Well, one, a few weeks, I come and get a big envelope, and there are pictures. There are three pictures in it. One of his, of his oldest son, that he looks exactly like our father. Then there is this little picture of a little boy, and he looks like me, sitting on my mother's lap. And then he wrote me, I told you I don't remember anything, but there is one thing I do remember. I was always praying, God help mommy, God help daddy, God help Mr. Leon. I ran to the telephone and I asked him, do you know who is Mr. Leon? He said, no. Well, Mr. Leon is our father. <laughs> our mother told you to pray for him. And then we started to cry because now we knew for sure that we found each other. And that, as I remember, you had phone calls pretty much every day for That's a long right. time. That's right. And then what happened? Then I decided to go to Poland, of course, and I called my brother and I told him that on April 28th, I'm coming to, to Warsaw to, 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 to meet him. And he called the Polish television and told them, you know, uh, my sister is coming, you know, and I want you to come to, you know, to Warsaw when she arrives, you know, to videotape this uh, as we meet for the very first time. And I called the uh, Israeli embassy and I told them the same thing. Why don't you send somebody because I really, really want, you know, have this moment when we meet for the very first time. And uh, he did it and, you know, for the first time we meet and, you know, like he was standing at the end there and, like a magnet, I went to him, he ran to me, and you know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to see what happened pretty soon here. Yeah. Yes. It was a very emotional... Emotional thing, yes. That's we such cried. a wonderful yeah. time. People yeah. were crying with us. They thought some kind of a politician came here. Why is this, you know, so many flashlights and, yes. you know, but that was us. <sighs> it's just, it's so wonderful. Um, after, eventually, your brother moved to Skokie and lived with you and your family, right? That's right, yeah. For Can, two years, yeah. And talk brother. a little bit about that, because he didn't speak English, right? Right. So it was very important for me that he learned English, and I kind of forced him <laughs> to go to night school and learn English. First, he, didn't, he couldn't do much of, you know, kind of important job, so he, like a lot of Polish people, you know, they know how to fix everything, you know, when they come to United States, they are usually helping people, you know, with uh, buildings and additions and so on, very handy people. So was my brother Adam, he was very handy, so he did that kind of, of jobs, uh, helping and so on. But that was not enough for me, because I wanted him to, you know, get citizenship. You know, and uh, you know, like sponsorship or whatever. And I went and uh, collected 200, maybe more than 200. I would say maybe 2,000 signatures from people that he will be accepted as a citizen. And I, you know, work for him like my own. I was my own uh, lawyer. C couldn't afford a lawyer. That's the, for sure. And uh, eventually, I get a letter from, Uni uh, from United, I mean from Washington, that a sister can sponsor a brother. And, you know, it took another, f I, I think, about 14, 14 years, and uh, he got his citizenship. So I feel very good about it. 
and he did too. Let's talk a little bit about what you learned about what happened to him when you ended up going and being adopted by that wonderful family. What happened to your brother? Okay, when I found my brother, I said, what happened, you know, after, you know, I was taken away? And he said that when they closed the ghetto, they took everybody to another death camp called Maidanek, and they did medical experiments on my brother. So my brother was never, you know, himself. And uh, uh, people ask him always, so did you get a number? No, he didn't, he, he did get a number, but they couldn't put a number on his arm because he was a small child. So they put it on his thigh. And eventually, <clears throat> when the Russians were coming, um, they threw him out, you know, in a, like a toilet, out, outdoor toilet. And when the Russian came, they found him because he was crying and they took him out. And for about many months, he was closed in a dark room because his eyes, eyesight was not so good. So eventually, <clears throat> as my brother was uh, in, the, in there, they opened an orphanage for the children that were survived. And my brother ended up with a Polish family who kind of took him in, kind of adopted him like foster parents. And he lived with them, that's what he told me until you know I found him. The problem was he wasn't, didn't they adopt or have several other children eventually after, and they ignored after. him? Yeah, that's true. They said Adam brought us, Adam brought us uh, luck because after they adopted him, they had six of their own children. Yeah. yeah. So he kind of lost his place he did. with that he family. Did. He felt it, that, you know, he wasn't that important anymore. Your, your brother worked as a handyman, correct? Yes, he did. Mentioned? He did, because he was very handy. He, first of all, he started, to, you know, to change my apartment, my house, to do everything the correct way. You know, if there was a leak, something, Adam was there to fix. And my friends found out about it, so he got more jobs. So he really supported himself. And eventually he collect, I mean, saved money, and he bought his own place. Were you ever able to find your sister? Yes. I left no stone unturned looking for my sister. And unfortunately, I never found her, and I have no closure about her. So I was always surprised because my sister was 10 years older than us, and I thought she should have come home, you know, if she was, you know, uh, you know 10 years older, but I didn't find her, and I'm sorry, I always suspected maybe, you know, she got mentally sick and she couldn't find herself or couldn't find us. Ida, I want to ask you about, about your family, but before I do that, I feel like there must be more that we should talk about, your story. What would, would you like me to say? Everything. <laughs> okay. I know, don't you want to hear more? Yeah. Okay, so I, uh, when I got married and I brought my daughter to United States, my main goal was that Esther will get a very good education and be an independent woman. So my daughter really, I told her, don't do any dishes, don't do any helping me, you do your homework. That's what I want from you, you know. And actually she got her MBA and he got a good job and then uh, I, she got married and I have two grand, grandchildren and um, we are right now very happy that, you know, we are kind of bigger family than just I am all by myself. Now I have a daughter and uh, a son-in-law who I respect very much and he respects me and my grandchildren that, you know, I'm very proud of them. Um, can I say more? Yes. Okay. You can say, you can say much more. Yes. Um, so... The one thing that happened that uh, kind of unexpected, my both grandchildren have autism. And uh, we work very hard for them to go, to get the highest way they can get, you know, to be more functional. And we spend a lot of money and a lot of time. And actually at, at one time I 
quit my job to take care of my grandchildren because I didn't trust anybody not to hurt them. And uh, eventually my oldest son, he is a genius in computers. He drives a car and he has a part-time job for which we are amazed that he can do such thing. And the younger, we taught him how to take public transportation. He also has two jobs. One, he works for Walgreens and you know, fills up the, the shelves with whatever they tell him. He also works for a supermarket jewel in my town. And he you know, pushes the shopping carts. But he is very you know, useful, both of them. I am very, very proud of them. They're even going to get social security. <laughs> How old are they? OK, my oldest son, Daniel, is 34. And Jonathan is 26. The grandchildren. My grandchildren, yes. OK, what else? What else can I say that I'm very proud? <clears throat> so I am a speaker already over 30 years. I speak to groups like you are here. I speak to students. Uh, I have very big uh, hope that when I speak, that people will take it to their heart. That's what happened to me. It can happen to you if you don't learn what, you know, from my, uh, from my experience. Because I am still alive. I am one of the youngest, almost, of Holocaust witnesses. You know, most of the people, even if they are witnesses, they're not able to speak. Well, their parents don't want to tell the, their children what happened to them because they don't want to scare them or hurt them. The children don't want to ask because they don't want to hurt the parents. And things are disappearing. So we, we people who are now organized themselves in Hidden Children, we are groups that do speak all over United States. I'll speak to any group. I do not take an, uh, any money for that honorarium, you call it, right? Yes. I'll do it. Anybody who calls me and tells me that, you know, they want me to speak, I will do it. Guess what, I have. we're going to give you an honorarium. I don't want to. <laughs> but it's going to go to your museum. Will you, oh, is that okay, museum? in yes. your honor? Thank you. We can, we, can You're use, welcome. we can use any help. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I just have to ask you, I, I've read your book. By the way, her book will be for sale in the, um, afterwards, yes. out in the lobby, and she'll be signing them. Um, I, I've read your story. I've, I've watched you on YouTube. Um, I, I cannot believe the life you've lived and the sorrow that you have experienced, also the joy. But I just have to ask you, how on earth can you be so positive after living through so much sorrow? Okay. My strength really comes from my Polish mother. I call my dear Polish mother. What she could do, I couldn't do probably. But I am trying to follow her steps, you know, to be, you know, strong and tell everything that it's very hard for me, you know, as I come to you and speak, you know, to tear my heart and t talk to you. Because it's not easy. You know, before I come here, I have nightmares. But it doesn't stop me from doing what I'm supposed to do. And I will forever do until as long as I am alive. I'm going to spread the word because anti-Semitism is coming out again. And I don't know how that can happen after what happened before. That, you know, history kind of repeats itself. But I kind of, we all Holocaust survivors depend on the young people. Because you, you know everything happens right now in a split of a moment. Hundred years ago, nobody knew what was happening in one little village or in the other village. So they couldn't even, you know, talk to each other or tell each other what's happening. But you have internet, you have all kind of, you know, tools that you can prevent what's happening. Because what happened to me, it can happen to you too. And it's happening around the world. But I have to tell what happened to me. I don't, you know, tell stories or, or anything. What I remember, that's what I say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have anything else you want to share before we watch the CNN? 
Well, it's very important for me to watch the CNN because uh, this will give you a little even more deeper understanding what I told you because, you know, in the 40 minutes that we are here on the stage, I cannot, you know, tell you everything. So I'll be so honored if you watch, you know, the part of uh, when I meet my brother in, in the airport in Warsaw. And I want to thank you so very much that you brought me here. I, I cannot, I have no words, you know, what you did for me, because, you know, it is so important that somebody who is not Jewish is in, interested in saving Jewish people, Jewish hearts, and tell other people, you know, what happened and how to, you know, not to happen. And you are, you are my other angel, really. That's all I can call you. You are my other angel. Will you, you will you stay with us? For a few minutes. And no one come and live with us. <laughs> well, when I'm old and I cannot walk anymore. Marv, where are you? Where are you, hon? We want her to come and live with us, right? Yeah. When I cannot talk anymore, you'll, you'll help me. We will. We will. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, um, we're going to watch this, but there was something else that I was thinking of that we should talk about. Maybe I'll think of it later. But this is going to be wonderful. Yes. So, Shane, we're ready. We're ready. <laughs> oh. You know, this week the U.S. government gave special permission for Polish immigrant Adam Pollock, Pollock rather, to live in this country. Now, his request was a very simple one, to live with the sister the horrors of war once made him forget he even had. Here's the incredible story of loss and redemption from our Chicago Bureau Chief, Jeff Flock. Adam and Ida Pollock, twins, together here on their mother's lap in Poland in 1940, and not, not together again until now. Nobody can tell me that the child does not remember. If you're not in shock like he was, you do remember. Though she was only three, Ida Pollock remembered it all. The ghetto being ripped from their parents the Christian couple who adopted and saved her. Adam Pollock remembered nothing, nothing of his family or the concentration camp where he ended up. They both spent the next 50 years searching. Every time I ask uh, them, what is my name, what is my name, they never told me. By 1995, Ida had all but given up finding her twin. Then a friend sent this newspaper article about other Holocaust survivors seeking their families. In it, this picture of a... One moment, please. <laughs> oh. you know, this week, the U.S. government gave special permission for Polish immigrant Adam Pollock, Pollock rather, to live in this country. Now, his request was a very simple one to live with his sister, the horrors of war once made him forget he even had. Here's the incredible story of loss and redemption from our Chicago Bureau Chief, Jeff Flock. Adam and Ida Pollock, twins, together here on their mother's lap in Poland in 1940, and not together again until now. Nobody can tell me that the child does not remember. If you're not in shock like he was, you do remember. Though she was only three, Ida Pollock remembered it all. The ghetto being ripped from their parents, the Christian couple who adopted and saved her. Adam Pollock remembered nothing, nothing of his family or the concentration camp where he ended up. They both spent the next 50 years searching. Every time I ask uh, them, what is my name, what is my name, they never told me. By 1995, Ida had all but given up finding her twin. Then a friend sent this newspaper article about other Holocaust survivors seeking their families. In it, this picture of a bearded man from Warsaw. When I saw the article, I brought the picture to the wall to compare, and I saw this is exact match. She saw a resemblance to this picture of her grandfather. I was in shock and I was thinking to myself, is it really possible that now, when I'm 55, I'm going to find my twin brother? Because I always felt that 
if I survive, he might have survived too. In the beginning, he called me like once in two weeks. Then we called each other every week. And we called each other every day. At the end, we called each other three and five times a day. We, we thought we were going to go crazy. Not long after, the two people who many thought were crazy for dreaming of a reunion like this lived it. Adam Pollock would normally have had to wait 10 years or more for the OK to live in this country. But the US government, moved by this incredible reunion, has given special permission now for him to live and work here. It's a miracle. We call it two miracles. One that we survived, yeah. and the other that we found each other. All my life, I feel like uh, I'm Miss missing something. Me too. You know? I celebrated the holidays by myself, my birthday by myself. Finally, when I found him, it's like I found a piece of me. I'm Jeff Locke, CNN in Skokie, Illinois. Well, they won't be celebrating alone anymore. Ida and Adam Pollock join us now with more of their reunion story and their search for yet another sibling of theirs. There are in our Chicago Bureau this morning and in our Washington Bureau this morning, genealogist John Coletta, who con conducts lectures and workshops on just how to trace your roots. Good morning, all. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to us this morning. morning. Ida and Adam, let me ask you one question. When you were watching the tape we just showed of your reunion, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? That finally it came through. Finally. You, you should never lose your hope. Did you ever lose hope at any point? Pardon me? Did you ever lose hope at any point? No, no, I didn't. I never, uh, I never imagined my brother dead, and I still hope that my sister is somewhere there. <laughs> now, your sister, is she an older sister or younger sister? She's an older sister. She's 10 years older than us, and I found out that she was taking care of us after my mother's death in, during our stay in ghetto before I was taken away. Mm, and you found your brother because someone brought to you a newspaper clipping. It's possible, perhaps, that somehow, some way, someone might bring uh, your, your pictures from this broadcast this morning to That's your sister. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping. If I could only reach her, uh, if you allow me, can I say something in Polish? Because if I find my brother in Poland, maybe she's still in Poland. Please, go ahead. Okay. Genia. My jesteśmy tutaj i bez ciebie to jest jeszcze nam brak ciebie. Żamby i wy, Genia i Martin C. Dwa Arec, a nachnu powę, nachnu crychim otach. Genia, a zdufasz tejs idyś, und dufasz tejs, mierdzenem du mir wartnow dir. Can you tell us what you said? I see, Genia, if you somewhere there, we are here, and without you we're not home. We're waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Adam, I would like to know, <coughs> how did you come to know or come to feel that you had a twin sister who was someplace else. You were raised by another family, Catholic I understand, in another country. Yes. You know, I never was looking for a sister because I, I don't remember uh, nothing from wartime. You know, I uh, was looking for somebody who recognized me, uh, who I am, uh, for somebody um, who helped me during the war. And for uh, and I was looking for mother every for every my life. You know, I never uh, give uh, information to newspaper. I am looking for sister because I don't know about sister. So what was it like the very first time you two talked on the telephone? And what did you talk about? You know, the uh, the uh, first uh, uh, the, uh, talking with Ida was um, very difficult because uh, she told me I am your twin sister and I asked her about the uh, age and she told me uh, she is three years older than I was you know and this was very uh, stranger for me and I uh, from beginning I, d I didn't believe uh, 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 in, uh, for, for, for that and uh, after where we talk where we uh, change opinion I started to believe and uh, the uh, uh, most uh, uh, important was my son, my, my middle son, mm -hmm. uh, told me, Father, uh, th this is for sure your family because uh, look for the pictures, uh -huh. uh, what she compared, you know, uh, own pictures from uh, childhood and the picture uh, who, who I received from Ida. Yes, you can see them. Th this was matching. Yes, you, know? you can see that resemblance there. Now, yeah. John Coletta in Washington, you've, you've probably heard this kind of story a number of times. 
Well, this is a bit more extraordinary than most, really? I must say. <laughs> a lot of people are doing genealogy and finding cousins or family relatives, but rarely is it as spectacular a story as this one. This is extraordinary. Tell me, with well, a listen, since we have Ida and Adam standing by there, what kind of advice would you give them for their search right now for their other sister? Well, uh, Ida, I was watching you during this presentation, I mean, during this video. How, how does it make you feel to, when you see this? Oh, my goodness, that was the happiest oh. time. This was the happiest time of my life when I, you know, after the war, of course, that I found my brother. This is something that um, it's hard to describe. You know, another miracle in my life, but... Um, there is something, you know, funny about it, too. My brother never forgave me that I made him older. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's wonderful. But we were, you know, like, like twins. You know, I start a sentence, he finishes the sentence. I, he started a sentence, I finish it. What do you want for food, for dinner? I want chicken soup. No, I want chicken soup, you know. One day we were, uh, can I say that too, a little? We want you to. Okay. Uh, one day we went, you know, we have some kind of cold, um, ga not garage sale, but a sidewalk sale. And he went with my husband one way, I went the other. I was looking for sandals, special sandals. So we come back, Adam comes and holds the sandals, and I hold my sandals, and we bought the same sandals. <laughs> you know, those things were happening all the time, you know. Um, I, you know, I couldn't, I don't know if I still have a little time. You do, my dear. I do? Okay. So, when I met Adam and I uh, decided, you know, that he has to come uh, with me after, after I came to, to Poland, but uh, there was a wedding of my girlfriend's son, and I'm talking about Warsaw, and we said, I said to Adam, I have to go to the wedding because he wanted me right away to go to his family. But um, I promised my friend that we'd go to the wedding, so we slept over in her house. So she put us, you know, like, uh, you know, he was on the sofa, I was in the other room, but the doors were open. And, we, you know, we just met, so we started to talk, talk and talk, and Adam likes to talk and ask questions. And I said, Adam, we have to go to the wedding tomorrow. It's 2 o'clock at night. We have to sleep, please. He said, okay. And suddenly I say, ah, called Kidba, and he sings, he sings it with me, the same lullaby that our mother was singing to us. Can you imagine that? And I asked him, how do you know that? He says, I don't know. He said, how do you know? I said, I, I suppose this is what our mother was singing to us. So things were happening all the time. It's amazing. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I also wanted to just mention, you, you were so close to Josephine, your adoptive mother, and I wanted to... That's what I forgot Then I wanted yes. to say. Okay. You brought her to the United States twice, didn't you? That's right. Could you talk when about that? When I made that? a little bit money, you know, the first thing I wanted is to bring my Polish mother. I should say my mother because, you know, she, she raised me, really. And she supported me and she took care of me. So I definitely wanted my daughter to, to meet my, you know, mother. And when she came from Poland, my, finally, my daughter says, oh, I have a grandma. You know, first time she has a grandmother because there were no grandmothers. So I took her all over, you know, the city, and I took her to the supermarket. <laughs> and when she saw the supermarket, she wanted to go. We were walking by the meat department, and she said, Ida, this could feed the whole Poland. <laughs> She didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted her to take her to a theater. To end. No, no, no. I want to go to the supermarket. <laughs> oh, you know, because in Poland at that time, people stood in lines for toilet paper. You know, there was nothing. And here she sees, you know, how we live, how everything is, you know, so available. She wouldn't believe. So I brought my mother twice to the United States. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring her to my daughter's wedding because she was already quite sick. 
And I also wanted to bring my Polish uh, uh, sister, you know, because she misses me. Sometimes she was jealous. She said, my mother lo loves you better than she loves me. <laughs> and uh, what can I say? There was all kind of, you know, things that we can stay here all night and talk about it. But Do you have anything else you want to say to remind before me if we... I miss something? All I want to say is thank everybody for coming here and listening to us, and thank you for inspiring me to come here and do it. I really have no words to thank you. I don't really have no words for, for what you're doing here in this community, and not only in the community, but you're spreading the same words I say, you know, about, you know, there shouldn't be any hate. There shouldn't be any... Uh, war anymore, there shouldn't be this, and you know, anti-Semitism, we suffer enough, this is enough is enough, so please, if you listen to me, tell people who deny that Holocaust happened, didn't happen, tell them, we saw a Holocaust survivor, a witness to the Holocaust, and who, that's who I am, and that's why I'm doing it, okay? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so glad you appreciated Ida and fell in love with her. And we'll see you out in the lobby. There are refreshments, books for sale, and she'll be signing them. So see you out there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.